CBS cameraman. Yeah. Yes, he had just been filming her, and he asked me, do you have a good side? And I'm like, I hope so. I mean, I didn't know what he was asking. <laughs> and then he explained, oh, it's because I was just photographing Gloria Vanderbilt, and she only allows herself to be photographed in one side of the mm. okay. Yeah. It's just too much stress. Well, I guess it's what she considers her good side. Yeah. I don't think I paid much attention to that. Yeah, I don't, I don't think most people do, but then most people aren't Gloria Vanderbilt. It's there. Yeah, so. All right. Okay, so, I, so this is recording us right now, just so you know. Kathleen Norris is the award-winning poet, writer, and author of the New York Times bestsellers, The Cloister Walk, A City in Me, Dakota, Amazing Grace, and The Virgin of Bennington. She's also published seven books of poetry, including the 1971 Big Table Younger Poets Award-winning, Falling Off. Kathleen's work explores the spiritual life with an intimate and historical perspective, leaving readers like myself breathless, full of tears, laughing and pausing in awe, sometimes all at once. While her work has been compared to Thomas Merton, Kathleen has an important and influential style that is all her own. While I was traveling to the 17 Cistercian Trappist Monasteries in the United States, Kathleen's book, A City in Me, accompanied me in the most intimate way a book ever has in my entire life. A brief story that Kathleen shared. She says that when she was working as an artist in elementary schools, she created an exercise for children using noise and silence. She said, I'll make a deal with you. First, you get to make noise, and then you'll make silence. Kathleen, it is a joy and honor to be in your presence here at St. John's University in Minnesota. Let's make some noise and maybe a little bit of silence. Welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you. That was such an exciting thing for me to work with kids that way. Mm. I got the most beautiful results. Some kids were honest. They said silence is scary. Mm. Um, but they really took to it, too. And uh, I think I remember one little boy wrote a very brief thing, a silent as a tree. Mm. You know, they, they got into it. Yeah. It was it was hard for them yeah. to settle down and really be silent. And once they did, I, I, I remember that was really a, a lot of fun for me to work with them. Of course, they loved making the noise. And <laughs> we could only do that for a few minutes because we didn't want the principal coming in and getting all upset. But yeah. they loved that part. But then the silence, she really means it. Mm. It was yeah. interesting. Yeah. Kids do well with noise. Oh, yeah. But yeah. they did surprisingly well with silence. Once they got yeah. into it, they really they really did like it. Although they, uh, a number of them said it's weird, it's scary, it, it makes me nervous. Mm. And I said, well, that's kind of what it's supposed to do. Yeah. It, it, because you're in a place where you don't normally go. Yeah. So it can be difficult. Right, right. And all the... The stuff that comes up when you do really sit in those silences, and um, in fact, when when you talk about writing, you talk a lot about the terror of the blank page, yeah. and um, which every writer knows. Yes, right, and even you know those people that are just facing a brand new day, um, and I wonder. You also talk a lot about discipline and rhythm and how that has been a gateway through getting through the tear, you know, of the blank page and. Um, how you feel. That was a big <clears throat> discovery for me about monasteries that the scaffolding, that the liturgy of the hours acts like a scaffolding. And one of the reasons I think I, fi I find I get a lot of work done in a monastery is first of all, there is a lot of silence. Mm -hmm. So you're sort of thrown back on yourself and you try to instill the inner chatter that goes on in your head all the time. But you can still that a little bit and things will emerge all of a sudden. I think I want to write about that, or I, that, that word or phrase will sort of loom up out of the silence. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is simply the structure of the day, that one of the things I learned is that if you have a work period, say you go to morning prayer from 6.30 to 7, and after that there's a work period, well, that's when you get your work done. Mm -hmm. It actually, it, and I never, as, an, as a freelance writer, I never thought that that kind of structure would be good for me as a writer, but it's wonderful. Yeah. Because you know when the work periods are, and you know when you go to prayers, mm -hmm. and you know, you work everything else, eating and exercise and reading or whatever else you're doing, you work that in, but that, it really does act like a scaffold. Mm -hmm. 
So one of the things we like to first ask people is, what's your earliest memory of encountering silence? Encountering silence. And this, I mean, your first memory might be a kind of toxic silence, or it might be a powerful divine silence. Well, it was mild, mildly toxic, not, okay. not really, because <laughs> both my parents were very verbal people, and mm -hmm. if they got really quiet, it meant probably something bad. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was something bad I did, I got a look, but no words, that was a bad sign. Yeah. Uh, so that would have been very young, like four or five, um, because usually my dad is wonderful with sarcasm. Hey kids, go out and play in the traffic. And you go, he doesn't really mean that. He's wonderful. <laughs> you learn the meaning of irony very young in my family, but I think I also learned a little bit about silence, that mm -hmm. if my mom was really silent, that meant that, that she was perturbed or worried or something was mm -hmm. wrong. My dad was the same way because he was pretty verbal. If he was silent, it often meant that he was disturbed or even angry over something we'd done and we had to sort of sort it out. But it wasn't super toxic, it was pretty normal mm -hmm. parental stuff. Mm -hmm. But I think that's probably my first memory. Mm -hmm. And how has silence played a role in your life as a writer? I mean, that's a big, that's probably a loaded question, but... Well, well one of the, um, you know, as we, we talked about the terror of the blank page um, and discipline and rhythm, um, how do you how do you tame that that monkey mind? To well, I think I just I probably discovered silence as a in college as a young woman when I really began writing in earnest. I was writing poems, and I felt like I needed silence around me to do that. Um, it helped that I after my sophomore year I think I had a room by myself. I didn't have a roommate. Mm. Um, or if the dorm got noisy, there was this all-night study room in the library, which was usually pretty quiet because people were working, and I could go. And for me to write, it, it was, um, it felt important to have some kind of silence around me and not the pressure of time mm. where I had to be doing something else or at, by a certain time. It was, it was a time thing, but also silence. And, but my husband, you know, as he published a couple books of poetry, he was just the opposite. He liked to go to a crowded place, like a bar or a restaurant, where he didn't know anybody and be surrounded by noise, and that's how he liked to write. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't surrounded by silence, although he used silence too, I think, in, in some of his writing. But I think that's when I first discovered the me, the, the, how important silence was for me as a writer when I was in college and I began really writing poems not for assignments or for class but because I really needed to. Mm -hmm. And so that became, silence became important to me then. Mm -hmm. and, and how about as it relates to, to place? I mean obviously in Dakota you talk a lot about the importance of place and um, I think there's a great uh, I have a great quote in here from Dakota specifically about you talk about the wind and you compare it to the ocean. Yeah. Um, well, and of course, the landscape of western South Dakota was an ocean bed, mm -hmm. with a shallow inland sea, and, and you just see the undulations. And you, you find things like nautilus shells and, and fossilized sharks there. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you can still find evidence of that. But somehow that rolling. Uh, Plains and the western plains did remind me of an ocean, and you can see where the weather's coming from, just as you can in the ocean. And somehow that wind sounded a, often would sound a lot like waves to me. Mm -hmm. And I think there's natural noise like wind that 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 contributes to silence. It may be loud, in in fact, but it's not mechanical noise. It's not human generated noise. Mm -hmm. It 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 actually feels more like silence than not, like rain or ocean waves or wind on, on, in grass and trees. Um, that has a silent quality to it because there's no words. Mm -hmm. And I say no mechanical sounds that are being made, it's just natural. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously some people, and even I have feared even that kind of natural silence from time to time. Um, and I know in the Cloister Walk, you know, you touched a little slightly briefly on, on acedia as a, compared to your book acedia and you heavily touched on it um you start talking about evangelists and 
obviously all your work is woven with you know the wisdom of third and fourth century monastics um, and I wonder uh, if there was a turning point where you just kind of unfolded this this deep vulnerability I mean you've always been very open about mental health and um, you know the new demon and all kinds of things and I wonder if there was a, a turning point in your life where you just kind of laid it all out not sure. I mean, silence may have had something to do with that. The fact that um, just that considering the, the desert of the four centuries, these early monks, how, how quiet that world must have been. Yeah. Because I mean, they wouldn't even have much rain. I suppose they would have wind occasionally. But they wouldn't have any distraction in terms of electronic media, uh, artificial light. It had to be so quiet out there. Mm -hmm. And even in the Western Plains, you get some of them. I mean, I know people who just freak out. They cannot handle the Western Plains, that sense that, um, yeah. that you know, you're out there and there's a sky and there's nothing mm -hmm. between you. You know, there's no mountains, there's no trees, there's, no, there's nothing to distract you. So I think that might have contributed to my being able to write about some of those deep, deep things. And one big irony for me is that uh, because of my husband's health and my parents were aging and stuff, about 18 years ago, we moved back to Honolulu, where I never expected to live again. That's where I went from junior high to high school. And Honolulu is really an exceptionally noisy city. <laughs> it's, uh, where I live is residential. It's not nearly as noisy as, as Waikiki, say, where every night you're going to have drunks and crazy people screaming on the streets and lots of sirens. I mean, my neighborhood is somewhat quieter than that, but I've decided that so many people are literally afraid of silence. Because mm -hmm. I'm in a concrete condo, and it's actually the noise proofing in that building is actually not too bad. But I can hear in the distance the freeway. It's not a oppressive, but it's a little bit of the background noise. And there's a street, uh, again, it's not right up against my building, but I can see it from my window um, and my lanai. Where there are city buses, there's a couple schools, so there's a lot of traffic in the morning, so there's noise there. But the thing that gets me is that, like, there's somebody in, in a little, we have a couple of two and three story apartment buildings near us. There's somebody there that on weekends plays music all the time. <laughs> all the time. And yeah. sometimes it's rap, sometimes it's a radio station. And I remember sitting in my, the little office I was trying to use, I had to put on noise-canceling headphones like I mm -hmm. use on an airplane in yeah. order just to drown it out. And that does really help. Yeah. But I thought that person is actually afraid of silence. Mm -hmm. They have to make noise all the time. And I thought if I lived next door to that person, I would be going crazy. Because if I can hear it 10 floors up, you know the next door neighbors must be hearing it. So there's a total disregard for other people and living in this cocoon of noise, mm -hmm. and it's almost, you know, there has to be some pathology there that a person is protecting themselves with noise. And I've got one family member that, that almost all the time, if you're riding in the car with him, he's got um, the music on. Yeah. And, and I've learned to just sort of live with it. It's fine. Yeah. Um, he's the kind of guy that gets into Facebook wars about Pink Floyd. So <laughs> He's got his own thing going. At least it's it's something like Pink Floyd. It's not anything nasty. It's just, but you know, um, to each his own, I guess. But that's one of the things I love about coming to St. John's because both down at the institute where our apartments are, and up here, even though you're surrounded by a couple thousand college kids mm -hmm. who sometimes will play their rock music, but there is this level of silence, and certainly in the church. And going to choir with the monks, there's a, a lot of silence. But I can walk out of my apartment at six in the morning and get a cup of coffee, and it's quiet. It's mm. just, it's it's really like heaven to be here compared to an, any noisy city. Yeah. But um, I really wonder about that fear of silence because you you see it everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's it's a strange thing. And, what I love about the liturgy here is like it's slow paced and people coming in from the world sometimes, oh my God, it's, it's so slow. And I'm like, this isn't it wonderful. And it, it takes a little adapting, but like when they read like at morning prayer or vespers or noon prayer, when they're reading psalms, they leave a full minute of silence between each psalm mm -hmm. and then a full two minutes after the scripture reading. So you're sitting there with a hundred people. 
and not a sound. It's just this wonderful, because somehow silence with other people is really cool. Yeah, that There's something know. about that, and I think that's one of the reasons that people, you know, still come to monasteries either for a retreat or to join, because there's something about doing silence with others mm -hmm. that is really deeply gratifying. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if it's so, the, in Dakota you talk about, again, the relationship to place, and you say that to be American is to move on as if we could outrun change. To attach oneself to a place is to surrender to it and suffer with it. And I wonder if you, if you think it's the same with silence, right? We, we have, a lot of times there's a lot of suffering in the silence so that we can grow with it and emerge from it um, with our words or with our... I think so, silence sometimes shows you what you're really suffering from. Mm. I know it's certainly, when I've been really busy and I go to a monastery on a retreat, and I sit there and I feel like I'm letting silence sink into my bones. And that can be here, at, uh, this happened to me in Trappist monasteries too, mm -hmm. where I don't plan anything at all for the first hour or so, just to sit there and let the silence sink in. And often that's when you discover what it is you're really worried about, what, it, what you're really suffering from, what your real concerns are. Because yeah. when you're busy in the world, either acti with activity or a lot of verbal stuff going on, you're you're ignoring some of those deeper things and yeah. sitting in silence for a while, um, it, it'll start to surface. Right, right. Um, I, I, loved, I love how in your writing you, you mention so many different authors, Emily Dickinson, and Thomas Merton, even George Orwell. Oh yeah, politics and, in the English language, okay. Yeah. I love that essay. <laughs> And uh, I'd like to hit Donald Trump over the head with it. Actually. <laughs> but, you know what? I that's you didn't hear that. You didn't hear I that. think that's our first mention of number 45. Yeah, I know. I really yeah. try not to say the T word. Okay. <laughs> um, and also, I, I wrote another note here about um, oh, yeah, you quoting William Stafford on the notes about poetry being a wild animal. Oh, yeah, he was wonderful. And I just love how you compared uh, this to our wild um, and incarnate God trying to be tamed by labels and domestic terminology. And we all do it. Mm -hmm. and we, we all do it. All do it. We all do, we all do. And there's some that that's one of the reasons the Psalms are so great, because they are wild. There's all mm -hmm. kinds of mysterious things in there. Sometimes the Hebrew scholars here, I'll say, what does that phrase mean? Mm -hmm. They say, nobody really knows. It's very ancient, and no one knows what it means. And I'm going, cool, I really like that. You know, <laughs> there is that wildness to it. And then you say your psalm, and you go, what did we just say? Isn't that crazy? And then you enter the <laughs> silence again. Yeah. And I, that's one of the things, that, that's one of the appeals, I think, that the psalms have, is that God is certainly not tamed mm -hmm. in the psalms. In fact, some, some theologian I quote someplace said that, God behaves in the Psalms in ways he's not allowed to behave in systematic theology. Mm. And that's really true. And there is that wildness there. Yeah, yeah. Because it's poetry. Right, right. And we talk a lot about poetry in the podcast and just how, you know, there's a rhythm to it, which is much like music, right? With silences and everything. And obviously you're a poet. Um, and you've referenced yourself as an evangelist for poetry. Oh, yeah. Uh, would you mind sharing some of the poets you've been reading lately? Oh, and when I, when I go to any audiences at all, and this has included in my life the people at a bull sale, the North Dakota State Legislature, I mean, I, I, I'm shameless in terms of evangelizing for poetry, <laughs> but, but I'll do it any place, any, the North Dakota State Legislature, why not? Mm. You know, and, and then you always pick poems that you know they can relate to and mm -hmm. that they will enjoy and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But, but I love to share, there's a poet named Jane, Jane Flanders who's not, her, I like to, have people who aren't that well known. I mean, Mary Oliver and Denise Thumbertop are favorites of a lot of people, and I do read them. But I share Jane Flanders. Um, she died too young, but she had a beautiful book called Timepiece, and I quote from that a lot. I also share uh, uh, Ann Porter, mm -hmm. who was uh, her first book of selected poems was published when she was 84, mm -hmm. and uh, was a finalist for the National Book Awards. I was on the panel that year, and everybody fell in love with this book. 
Um, she's a really interesting poet. She published another book after that, um, is now deceased, but you know, again, she's a poet that um, just these beautiful lyrics, and she's not that well known. Um, who else have I been reading? Um, well, Hildegard of Bingen and Mechthild of Magdeburg, actually. Mm -hmm. I, I just finished writing a paper, or reviving a paper I'd written years ago on Mechthild of Magdeburg. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think she's a 13th century poet. Uh, and again, not as well known as Hildegard, but, but actually, in some ways, a more interesting poet. She's a very feisty woman. She was a Beguine. Mm -hmm. And she only entered a Benedictine monastery. They took her in when she was in her 70s and going blind. And they're the reason we have her poetry because that's their scribe wrote it all down. Okay. And so it's a, it's a, it's an interesting story. But she like she has these images like the apes of worldliness. And mm -hmm. Yeah, any bartender knows about that. You know? <laughs> and uh, she had visions, but but they're very. You know, and she was always fighting with church authorities. I mean, she's really a you know, I think we would have had to invent her if she didn't exist, this crazy feminist, before the word existed. But uh, and who else? I'm trying to think who else. I haven't been, I've been reading novels and history more than poetry lately. Um, do, you, do you have a, any favorite saints or uh, desert monks? Oh, the Igrius is my boy. Who's that? I love the Igrius. Igrius. I love the Igrius. I mean, he yeah. really, he really changed my life. Yeah. And that encountering that passage on the CD, I'm like, oh my God! So I finally found a description mm -hmm. of something I've had for years, and I never knew what it was. Yeah. And it just, it. I was standing in this little monastery library in Western North Dakota, and get a very quiet place, and I'm just, I wanted to scream and dance for joy, but I don't think I did. I didn't want to disturb the librarian next next door, but I just was going, my God, this is incredible. Mm -hmm. And so, and then the, the, there are the desert amas, the women. Mm -hmm. Synclectica is probably mm -hmm. um, the best. And she has a good passage, a famous one actually about Ascedia, that there are two kinds of sadness. One is a good kind of sadness when we're grieving over our faults and our sins and, and uh, the weakness of, of hum humanity. The other is is basically acedia is mm -hmm. is a is a false kind of sadness that leads us astray, mm -hmm. and she has just a lot of wisdom. Again, it, and apparently she was actually an influence on the Vagrus. He knew of her sayings, and I don't know if they ever met, but he knew of her sayings, mm -hmm. and she actually influenced some of his own writing. So that the women of the desert were pretty interesting too. Yeah, yeah. Um. I would love if you, A City and Me was a, was a book that just deeply touched my soul and um, some people are a little surprised by that because, you know, I'm a queer woman, not married, um, you know, so what was there to relate to? Well, uh, the way you touched on monasticism and rhythm and um, being a writer and the, you know, the, the pains, you, you have a way of just touching the depths of the human soul that we all encounter in some way. And I literally, I mean, I literally wept through the majority. I wept when I was writing. Okay. okay. Can <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can only imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it just was an incredible book, and I thank you so much for that. Um, and I always tell people that was the hardest book for me to write, partly because so many things in my life were going on with the death of my parents and my husband and everything. Mm -hmm. That was kind of going on, but also, just because of the subject matter, it's so depressing, and having yeah. to read all these really depressing uh, books and articles, and you just kind of, you know, I almost got broke down and watched The Sound of Music or something. Mm -hmm. I needed something to counteract the, yeah. all the, the depressing stuff. So I tell people it was the hardest book for me to write, and it's in ways the most difficult to read, because mm -hmm. it's, there are long chapters instead of short ones, and, and you go into the depths. You really do yeah. get into stuff that is, is difficult to deal with. But I've gotten a lot of very nice responses from psychologists and even psychiatrists yeah. who say we're glad someone is addressing this outside of yes. our profession because because this is you know they find some meaning there and the beautiful way in which you address the CDM and still address the separation you know sure yeah I still take my mental health meds like I'm not gonna stop because clearly this is just CDM 
or it might be, but I need to navigate that and being able to separate mm -hmm. and understand the difference. And that was a huge challenge. I had to do yeah. a lot of research in reading about psychology and and all of that, and also making it clear because uh, the first time I published an article about it, I got a it was just a brief article in Christian Century. I got a letter from a psychiatric nurse, and she said, "I think you're you're blaming people. You know, the, the danger here." She it was a nice letter, mm -hmm. but she said the danger here is if you people are going to feel like you're blaming them for what is a mental illness, mm -hmm. and if it's a sin. And so I had to, and I, and I wrote her back and thanked her, and I said, I'm really aware of this problem, and that I have to, mm -hmm. I address it several times in the book. Yeah. Because um, there's really no, there's, there are distinctions between, like, acedia and depression, mm -hmm. but they're also linked, mm -hmm. and it's hard to distinguish between the two. But certainly you can't say that someone depressed is sinful. That doesn't make any sense, although mm -hmm. that's what used to be the, kind of the gut, uh, the, the knee-jerk response. Yeah. Uh, like that incredible story about a priest who told a nun, you, you're a nun, you can't be depressed. Mm -hmm. Really, that's you know, such bad psychology and bad, bad theology too, really. Yeah. Um, so that used to be the opinion, but I was very conscious when I was writing the book that I had to make that distinction so people wouldn't feel that, feel guilty for something that they, they shouldn't feel guilty about. A mm. senior is something you can contend with. Depression is a whole different animal. Mm. You know? Would you mind, for those, for those listening that maybe don't quite know what a senior is, could you kind of share a little bit yeah, about that? It's never really been translated. It's, people still use that Greek word in English. It basically means not being able to care even to the extent that you no longer care that you can't care. I mean, it's mm. this really w weird mixture of restlessness, boredom, despair. And it's, I think it's as common, and I think that I agree with the desert monks, that it is a major human emotion, the same as anger or greed or envy. It's just been ignored and sort of tucked in the corner. Um, Mm -hmm. And I do think that's an interesting history that the monks had eight bad thoughts and the Cedia, anger, and pride were considered the worst. Mm -hmm. And a hundred years after the, their, their writings sort of became, or their sayings became written down, um, I think it was Gregory the first who codified seven deadly sins. And he kind of, I guess the feeling was that a Cedia would only be suffered by monks because they were living this very regimented life. Mm -hmm. And they would be susceptible to that kind of boredom and restlessness, and is there any meaning to this, and, and you know, succumbing to acedia. But ordinary people wouldn't experience it, which is one of the dumbest things ever. But that's <laughs> what they did. And so there were only seven deadly sins, seven deadly sins, and acedia was just kind of tucked into the the sin of sloth or laziness, and the whole spiritual aspect of it was kind of lost. You have you, you have to go back to the fourth century to find the writing about how devastating real acedia can be. Mm -hmm. It's not just laziness, it is something much deeper and really terrible than that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also referenced as the noonday demon. Yeah. yeah, because it tended to strike the monks at noonday, as you can imagine in the desert, if you've been up since four in the morning and you've been praying and weaving your little baskets as you pray, well by noon you're you're beginning to wonder if this is all worthwhile. I mean, the yeah. heat is really oppressive. Yeah. And you want to sleep, and you want to do what you, you just don't want to do what you're supposed to be doing. I, uh, just a, a quick uh, quote from your book, Acedia and Me. Acedia is not a relic of fourth century or a hang-up of some weird Christian monks, but a force we ignore at our peril. Um, yeah, it's like if yeah. you ignore anger, it come, tends to get you. If you ignore right. Acedia, it tends to come up and grab you. Bubbles up. Yeah.